Trevor Lackey here with a book review of Out by Natsuo Carino. Uh, Natsuo Carino is a Japanese author, and this was a book that was translated. So, uh, mo all the names in here of the characters are Japanese, and it takes place in Japan. So, I'll probably mispronounce some things, so sorry about that. Uh, and I got this book uh, as an interlibrary loan. Uh, I don't know if you know what an interlibrary loan is, but if you want a book that's not at your public library, they'll uh, look and get the book from another public library in another town or another part of town or somewhere else, you know, and have it sent to your public library that you go to, and then you can check it out from then. So I got this from inter interlibrary loan from, uh, where was it from? Benedictine College Library in Atchison, Kansas. So that's a uh, so if there's ever a book you want to read that's not at your public library, just ask to get it on interlibrary loan. Okay, so back to Out by Natsuo Carino. I had read this book when I was like in high school, and I at the time I thought it was like oh it's really violent, you know, and I think that's why I wanted to read it because yeah, I, I couldn't watch rated R movies then or uh, play M-rated video games, but books aren't rated and. I had uh, parents who just wanted me to read, so I read violent things instead of watching them on TV or playing a video game of it. So, the premise of this book is that uh, there's a group of four women who work at a factory, who work the night shift at a box lunch factory. They make like, I guess like TV dinners. One of them ends up killing their husband, and then the other ones help dispose of the body. That's the basic premise of the book. And then... From there, a bunch of other stuff happens. I'm when I first read it, I was like, "Oh man, this is cool. It's really violent." But reading it a second time, uh, at an older age, I feel like it's there is a lot of violence in it, and some people might think that's like a selling point. But I thought it was interesting how lonely the characters were, and how all of them seemed like they had drifted apart from just society in general, from their family, it was, I don't know, it was, I guess it's kind of sad, you know, how people drift apart as time progresses sometimes. And that the, the main, every character in here was like lonely and they kind of were drawn together, I guess because of their loneliness or something, I don't know. It was just interesting. It's not for everyone. This book wouldn't be for everyone. I wouldn't say I would buy it. I would maybe get it from the library. Well, I mean, I did get it from the library. But I would say if you can handle the violence, uh, there's murder, rape, and uh, dismemberment of bodies in the book being described. If that would bother you, then don't read it. But if you can handle the violent part, or if you want to read about the violent part, uh, then I would recommend checking it out at the library. And that's how I'm going to rate this book, as a library checkout. Uh, now I'm going to go into the story. So if you don't want to know what happens, just click off the video, because I'm going to go into the entire story. It'll probably be a long video. Okay, so... Basically, the way the book is set up, it's... Like, a couple different parts, and each, you know, there's chapters. And each chapter tells the story, tells a a character story basically or sometimes they'll tell it tell the same event but from a different character's perspective that way you know the other character's thoughts as the events are unfolding uh, and then the not all all the characters you know have solo chapters I guess you could call it but there's a couple that do uh, that you wouldn't think would get them like one of them is well well we should just Oh, well, there's a couple of them that you would think they wouldn't get chapters. There's a, a detective. I think it's e, the Detective Imai. I don't know. I probably said that wrong. Uh, he has his own chapter, and his chapter was about how he felt that the wife killed her husband, Yayoi. I don't know if I said that right. But uh, Yayoi Yamamoto is the woman who strangles her husband, chokes him out with a belt and kills him. I said that towards the beginning of the book, maybe like the second, third chapter. Uh, but she kills her husband, right? So there's Yayoi Yomamoto, 
and her husband, I can't remember, Kenji Yamamoto, that was his name, Kenji Yamamoto, he, you know, had a job, but then he became a gambling bum who was going after some prostitute at a hostess club or something like that, right? And so he's wanting to be with this other woman that he has no chance of being with, and he's gambling away all their money playing Baccarat. And the club where he goes to try and hit on this woman, uh, and the casino that's above where he gambles playing Baccarat is owned by the same person. It's owned by this guy named Satake. And he also goes by Sato as his, like, an alias, right? And he ends up being the villain of the story. Satake does. So Kenji Yamamoto, you know, he comes home drunk one night, and his wife, Yayoi Yamamoto, is about to go to work, to work the night shift, right? And she's fed up with him. Uh, the Kenji Yamamoto guy had hit his wife in the stomach, and had, she had this huge bruise. And so she was, uh, you know upset that she has an abusive husband that wants to cheat on her so uh and gambled away all their money all the money that they had saved and so she kills the guy chokes him out in a fit of rage and right in the entryway he lays dead so then she calls up one of her work friends uh masako katori and masako katori is the main character of out i would say uh she Seems very mysterious at the first, you know, because everyone doesn't really know what she used to do before she worked at the box lunch factory. But it turns out later on they uh, say that she used to work at like a credit union, like a bank. And uh, at the credit union they treated her really bad and she's, she wanted to go up, you know, and get promoted because she'd been there for so many years. And she said that I should be promoted and all these people who are getting promoted are just because they're guys but they don't know what they're doing. I'm a better worker. And then they made it, you know, impossible for her to get her work done. They gave her too much work, and eventually she got pushed out of the company, right? So uh, then she started working at this box lunch factory. And Masako, her husband is a, what was his name? I think it's like Yoshiki. And then her son is Nobuki, if I remember the names right. Uh, and the Yoshiki guy, her husband, he's like become detached and they live in separate rooms basically he just doesn't really talk at all to her doesn't really they really don't have meaningful conversations right and they just have drifted apart basically and she describes her husband as trying to become a hermit and she's like i don't want to live with a hermit you know that just secludes himself from the world he thinks everyone else is corrupt basically and that he is the only one who's you know keeping it real i guess uh, and then her son, Nobuki, he got kicked out of high school. I forgot what, why the reason was, but he got kicked out of high school, right? And so then he got a job as a plasterer, and uh, he hadn't talked to his mom for, like, months, according to the book. Like, he hadn't talked for months at all, right? So her, Masako Katori's family life is bad, too. She's basically alone. And then the Yoyi Yamamoto, she has two young sons and they had a cat and then once she killed her husband the cat named milk ran away right and then when she tried to get the cat or anytime she would see the cat in the neighborhood the cat would run away so because the cat saw her murder her husband kenji and then there's like a group of four women that were kind of friends at the factory and then the other two one is yoshie azuma and she is like the oldest lady her, nick, she, her nickname is the Skipper, and she's basically the woman who controls the speed of the line. She's kind of like the leader at work, you would say. Masako Katori is more like the leader, you know, outside of work. Uh, but Yoshie, uh, she's a widow. Her husband had died, and she has to take care of her invalid mother-in-law, who used to, you know, treat her bad. Uh, and then she has a daughter uh, named Miki. And she's like in high school, right? And so, and they, she lives in a really bad old rundown house, you know. And money's really tight. She doesn't never have any enough. The factory, they get paid more to work the night shift, but they still don't make that much money, you know. So, it's hard for them to get by, you know. And then, uh, come to find out later, she had an older daughter, 
uh, I think her name was Kazue, and she had a kid, and she just showed up one day, dropped off the kid, and left. So then the Yoshia Azuma had to take care of her grandkid, her invalid mother-in-law, and then she had a daughter that was in high school, and she was working the night shift. So everything was really tough for her, right? And then uh, the, the last, the fourth woman in their group was Kuniko Jonichi, Jonochi. I don't know if I said that right. I probably said it wrong. But she's, uh, I feel like uh, the author, Natsuo Kurino, wrote Kuniko to be unlikable. Like, I just found her to be the most unlikable of the four women. Uh, they describe her as being overweight and lazy and she's really materialistic and she almost sounds like she's bipolar because it said that she's, she'll like have super confidence at one moment and then the next moment she has like no confidence at all and she's always trying to buy things to try and fill a void in her basically and around the same time uh, Yayoi Yamamoto kills her husband uh, Kuniko's husband well husband quote unquote husband they were just living together uh, common law marriage, right? Uh, he leaves. He up and leaves, doesn't tell her anything, just leaves. And so now she's by herself, and she's in a lot of debt, and she owes money to loan sharks, right? So, things are looking bad. And then when Yayoi calls uh, Masako Katori to ask for help about the body, Masako comes up with an idea to get rid of the body. And what they're going to do, check out the idea from at work, when they're putting the meat on the line, on the in the box lunches, and what she was planning to do was to cut up Kenji's body, dismember him, and then throw away the body in trash bags in uh, the trash. So, and she was going to bury the head, and she buries the head in like a forest. So, uh, to do it, she picked up the body, and then. Masako and Yoshie go to Masako's house and cut up Kinji Yamamoto's body in the bathroom. Uh, Yayoi doesn't help because her husband didn't show up and they wanted her to be at home, like, waiting nervously for her husband to show up. So when they talked to the cops and said that, you know, he was missing, it made her seem like she didn't do anything to him. So that's basically... Yayoi Yamamoto's role throughout the whole thing is to be a wife who's killed her husband, who's pretending that she didn't kill her husband, that she didn't know what happened to him, right? And the thing was, the, the night before he killed, but, but, but the night before Kenji got killed, the main villain of the, of the book, Satake, uh, kicked him out because he was asking for a, a loan and he had been causing trouble for the the hostess prostitute lady, Anna, that worked at his club downstairs. So he kicks him out, beats him up some, the Satake guy beats up Kenji some, right? And so that's a main plot point. Uh, and so they cut up his body, and while they're cutting up their body, Kuniko Jonochi, who is looking for money because she had heard that uh, Yoshie got a loan from Masako for some money. So she goes to Masako's house and is knocking on the door, being annoying, trying to peer in and look. And so then uh, they decide they have to answer the door. And this is while they're cutting up the body. And they, she's like, what's going on? You know, she's being nosy and really annoying, uh, like her character is. And so then uh, they let her in and show her what they're doing, that they're cutting up Kenji's body. And she's freaking out, puking. And she couldn't believe that they're doing such a thing and that it was just so bad. And then... Uh, Masako says that, hey, we can get you some money. We can get you like 500,000 yen. And that's another thing about this book. At the, the front of it, towards the front of it, it shows uh, like a conversion from yen to the U.S. dollar. And it says it's calculated at a rate of 125 yen to the U.S. dollar. But this is an old book, so the, things, the conversions might be different. But, you know, I thought that was really interesting because it's always about money. Every character in there needs money. Every character in this book wants money. Or every in this character in this book is spending money, basically. So, it's basically about broke people who need money who are lonely. That's that's the plot. That's the plot right here. Broke people who need money and who are lonely. So, 
I felt that was really helpful having this in the book because every time they'd say so, so much yen, you'd have to look and be like, okay, that's like that much money in U.S. dollars. But, uh, so Kuniko agrees to help, and basically all she has to do is throw away a couple of the bags. And Masako takes the head. Yoshie takes some of the bags too. And she basically says, hey, get rid of this stuff as discreetly as possible. Try not to be seen. Don't put it anywhere where someone might find it, right? So, Kuni, uh, Yoshie and Masako, they get rid of their body parts. Masako buries the head, right? And then Kuniko, they describe when she got, like, her chapter, talking about her with the, the body. She's, the first thing she does, she tries to get rid of the, the body in the same neighborhood where Masako lives, which I thought was just dumb. And she tries to throw it in the trash, but some one of Masako's neighbors is like, Hey, don't throw that trash in my trash can. You don't live here. And so she gets nervous. She runs off, and she's driving around trying to figure out where she's going to go. And then she goes to Kogane Park, and she throws away the trash in the park's trash cans. Major plot point. And so things are going all right. The detectives are, you know, starting to look, f f look for Kenji. And some people are thinking maybe, you know, he just left, you know, maybe that's what happened. So, yeah, at that point, it was like Kenji Yamamoto, most people were thinking that he just left his wife, right? And Yoyo was all alone. But then, because of Kuniko's neglect and laziness, uh, someone in the park found the parts of his body. And then, through that, the cops were able to identify who he was because they had, like, the palm print. And so they're able to figure out that it was Kenji. So now there's been, there's definitely been a murder. The cops know there's definitely been a murder and they're trying to figure out who did it. There was two detectives in there. I think the one was Imai, he had a chapter and he thought that Yayoi Yamamoto had something to do with it, but he couldn't prove it. He couldn't find any hard evidence. And so he felt like it was almost futile to try and continue going up that tree. But then the other one, I think his name was Kinugasa and he, that Satake did it because it was reported that uh, Satake had been seen fighting with Kenji Yamamoto the night of his murder. And so they thought that uh, Satake had something to do with it. And so there was one day Satake just felt like something was off, right? And so he goes to this gambling club and then all of a sudden the cops come in and there's like a sting, you know, and he's like, oh, okay. I I thought this was just because, you know, I'm running uh, an illegal casino, basically. But then it turns out he's being questioned about Kiji Yamamoto's murder, right? And he spends quite a, some time in jail. And he had already been in prison. So, because Satake, they would talk about him, and he killed a woman and raped her. Uh, and somehow he got out of jail after so many years. But no one knew about this. The people that worked for him and the hostess club and at the casino didn't know about this. And then it, it came to light once he went to jail and then everyone treated him differently. And he had tried to bury this evilness inside of him, you know. But at, once he gets out of jail, he realizes that he lost everything that he had built since he got out of prison. His, you know, his hostess club prostitution ring and his casino that he is making money off of so he lost all of that lost his money most of it at least you know and so he basically decides he's going to get revenge on uh, the four women who caused Kinji's death and disfigured dismembered him and thus basically took away his empire of illicit stuff so that's when he basically becomes the main villain of the book right and while this stuff is happening, uh, Kuniko is trying to blackmail Yayoi into giving her more money because she needs money, right? Because she owes money. And she had got a loan from this loan shark who was had two aliases. Well, he had two names, basically. His real name was Akira Yamada. And then he went by Akira Jumanji. I think it's Jumanji. That's how I always said it, Jumanji. <laughs> like, game. So, uh, and this guy, he had been in a gang you know, before, and then he just became a loan shark, basically. And he was trying to figure out what he's going to do because he felt like the loan shark gig was about up, right? And uh, Kuniko had uh, 
blackmailed Yoyo Yamamoto into like co-signing one of her loans for Akira Jumanji's loan shark business, right? And so then Masako hears about that, so she takes Kuniko and takes goes to see Akira Jumanji, and then they realize they know each other because back in the day, uh, he had uh, basically him and his gang had been the muscle for uh, the credit union that uh, Masako worked for. And so he was intrigued by this whole situation. And he didn't know why they wanted to, uh, at the time he didn't know why they wanted him to take Yayo Yamamoto off the cosign thing, right? And Masako did that because she thought it was a sign that uh, something had happened, you know, and that Kuniko was, it would show that Kuniko was blackmailing her because of something, because she knew something about possibly what happened to Kinji. But she did. So, uh... That stopped that, but then uh, Jumanji was so curious that he decided to bribe, well not bribe, but to trade the debt on Kuniko's loan for the information of what really happened to Kinji Yamamoto. Because by this time, everything was in the news about this, dis this, member, this dismembered body being found in a park, you know? And no one else found the other parts of the body because it went in the trash and then the trash was incinerated. And so he goes and talks to Kuniko. Kuniko spills the beans because to get rid of the $400,000 loan would be marvelous to her because then it gave her the $500,000 that she made for disposing of Kinji's body and that would just be spending money. And she loves to spend money. That's all she thinks about is wasting money on clothes and makeup. So she does that. She makes the deal. She tells Akira Jumanji exactly what happened. And so he is intrigued by this, and he decides that he knows a guy from back in his day when he was in a biker gang that is, like, deep in the Yakuza. So, and his name is Soga-san. So he asks Soga-san, like, hey, I think we can start this business of disposing bodies, right? And so he hires, he basically gets uh, Masako, and then Masako gets Yoshie to go along with it, and they agree that they'll dispose of bodies the same way they did with Kinji. And uh, Kira Jumanji knows a place where he can go and get access to an incinerator so he can just go and bring, bring the body in boxes, throw it in an incinerator and burn it. And then, you know, no one will be able to figure out what happened. And so they do this one time, it's some old guy, you know, and they, they, were, they were assuming that he was killed because it meant someone would inherit some money, right? Or a business or something like that. So they cut up this guy, it's not that bad, send him off, everything goes smoothly, right? And, uh, at this point, Yoshie Azuma, you know, had quite a bit of money. She was planning on moving, and then she was planning on uh, paying for her youngest daughter to go to college. But then her older daughter, Kazue, comes back to take back the kid that she had left, and uh, she stole the money from the hiding spot that the mom had, and she knew that her daughter knew about the hiding spot, and she must have checked it and saw that there was like 2 million yen or whatever there and just took the money from her mom. And so now she's distraught, and she's actually looking for an opportunity to make more money, as in looking for another body to cut up. At this point, uh, there had been, uh, Masako had this feeling that they were being uh, watched by some unseen force, by some evil force that were after them, trying to get back at them, and which was Satake. But uh, no one, she really didn't know how to describe it to anyone else, and no one seemed to sense it. But, uh... They sent this woman to spy on Yayo Yamamoto, and it was quite easy. Her name was Yoko Morisaki, was what the name she went by. She worked for some detective agency that uh, Satake had hired to get all this information about, right? So she infiltrates their family, basically, and then she leaves, and Yayo Yamamoto's distraught because she, you know, felt like she finally found a friend that didn't judge her for possibly killing her husband because everyone assumed she had something to do with it, but no one can really prove it. So then it talks about Satake, and he had all this information that he'd gathered, and he was positive, you know, that they had did this thing. And so then he starts his payback. And uh, the first thing he did was he got a job at the Night Factory. Okay, wait, I forgot one character. Uh, at the beginning of the book, they talk about there was rumors that uh, some, uh, some guy was trying to uh, assault the women as they were walking to the factory. Because the parking lot was this in this one area, and they, from the parking lot they had to walk past this old factory to get to the box lunch factory. 
that they worked at. And so because of that, they built a uh, guard house at the parking lot basically to make sure nothing was happening in the parking lot to the women, right? And uh, before they did that, uh, there was one character, his name was Kazuo Miyamori. He was a Brazilian immigrant who was half Japanese, half Brazilian. His father was a Japanese immigrant to Brazil. And then he had heard that he could go to Japan and he could make some money there in Japan and come back and be able to afford to buy a car in Brazil. And that was his plan, to go to Japan, work for two years, and then come back to Brazil and be balling and buy a car and then have enough money to invest into some kind of business venture himself. But he was really hating working there. Like the, he hated it and uh, he didn't like it. Uh, at one point he tried to uh, grope Masako and actually walked by the old factory. So, and then he felt really bad and he knew what he did was wrong and uh, he was trying to uh, get Masako's forgiveness, but at the same time he like fell in love with her, which was weird because Masako was like four, in her 40s and this guy was like in his 20s. Uh, and then uh, even, uh, that's one thing about Masako, it seemed like all the men were attracted to her in this book. Like even Akira Jumanji, the guy who was the loan shark who came up with the idea of dismembering the bodies, he, he in his thoughts, uh, it seemed like he was even attracted to her, even though he was into hooking up with high school girls, which is problematic itself. But and then uh, the Satake guy, the villain guy, he wanted he w he was attracted to Masako too because he reminded Masako reminded Satake of the woman he had killed before that sent him to prison. So it's kind of weird. But uh, so uh, they built the guardhouse, right? And then. Uh, Satake gets a job as a guard during the night shift, right? And it's, but he goes by Sato, that's his other name, right? And so another thing he did uh, at this time was he got an apartment in the apartment complex that Kuniko lived in. And Kuniko, being how she was, was desperate for a man and uh, basically sets herself up and gets herself killed way sooner than Satake had planned on killing her because she thinks she's going to hook up with Satake, and then he just, you know, ties her up, strangles her, basically, and kills Kuniko. Satake kills Kuniko, right? And then he gets uh, them to cut up Kuniko. He hires them to dispose of the body of Kuniko. So he, he's obviously sending a message to them, you know, and when uh, he goes to do it, he he's really careful. He doesn't. He just backs up so no one sees his license plate. And they dropped it off, and it was different because he didn't do it the same way that the other people did, like a different avenue. You know, somehow he found out about it, and they weren't sure how. And so the Sogasan and some of his uh, yakuza were there with uh, Jumanji as he dropped it off, and Akira Jumanji felt like this guy was like that he had killed the woman and that he was freaked out about it. And you could tell that Yoshie and Masako and Akira Jumanji didn't think they'd end up cutting up women. And then when they found out it was Kuniko, they, they freaked out and they felt like this was like divine punishment, you know, for what they were doing and that they would end up like Kuniko. And they were certain now, uh, Masako was certain now that someone was trying to get to them. And that they were going to go after them next. Uh, so they actually do cut up Kuniko's body. And then after that, uh, Yoshie quits going to work. Uh, Akira Jumanji is about to skip town. He's like freaking out. And then uh, Masako is still trying to figure out who it is, who Satake is. She doesn't know who he is yet, you know. And uh, at this time, she figures out, you know, who he is, whose alias is, that he's Sato the guard, right? And so then he figures out his name, where he lives, and then he use, she uses that and uh, Akira Jumanji and his loan shark business to make him seem like he's a cosign, a cosigner for Kuniko Jononchi's uh, loans, right? 
And the thing was, Kuniko quit before he killed her. Like three days before he killed her, Kuniko quit. So at the factory, they don't expect her to show up. And then, because uh, she had got money, you know, for uh, disposing of Kenji's body. <laughs> so she quit. So no one is expecting her. So everyone assumes that she skipped town. And so then all these enforcers for the loan shark businesses come and say like hey you were a co-signer for kuniko jironchi's uh loans uh you need to you need to you know get her to pay or figure out how who's going to pay you know and so he's really annoyed by this and he realizes that masako and the jironchi guy did this to him and so now he's he can't go to the apartment that he lived in that was in kuniko's apartment complex and people started asking because he would drive her car, which was like an imported Volkswagen Golf. So everyone knew her car because, you know, no one at the factory had a nice car like that. But uh, he, would, he would even park it like she would, like haphazardly. And so that was another way for him to freak out Masako. But then Masako realized who he is. And it looks like they're about to have like their showdown, you know. But then... Uh, Yoshi Azuma saves her, basically, by riding up on the bicycle. And then it's like they're going to go to work, but then all of a sudden, uh, one of the higher-ups at the the health inspector, I think, yeah, the health inspector, comes out and says Yoshi Azuma's house is burning down, right, right before they go to work. And I think, uh, I think Yoshi might have burnt down her own house to collect the insurance money, but I'm not for sure. But it seemed like... She wasn't very surprised in that she was going to do it. And Moscow asked, well, did you have insurance? And she's like, yeah, a couple hundred thousand. So I think Yoshie burned it down. Or maybe you could conjecture that Satake burned it down. But I don't know. So uh, then Masako, it sounded like she was going to go to work, but she didn't. She was looking for Kazuo Miyamori, the Brazilian immigrant guy. Because as time went on... Uh, they started to trust Kazuo Miyamori, and she had Masako had gave him the money to put in his locker at work that she had got from disposing of the bodies, and so he has to, she has to go to his apartment because he was working that day, and then he goes gets the money right, and then she's leaving. Hopefully, she's about to get out, and that's hence the name out because everyone's trying to get out of the lives they're living basically. And uh, it's towards the end of the book, the last chapters. Uh, and it looks like she's about to get out. She's at her car. Then she realizes that Satake is probably nearby. And Satake chokes her out, drags her into the old factory. That used to be a box lunch factory, too. And then uh, they struggle. I mean, she's struggling to get away. But he captures her, and then he uh, assaults her. And... Then she uh, is able to, she had a scalpel in her jacket pocket, and she's able to get the scalpel out. He didn't know anything about a scalpel being in her jacket. And so she put the jacket on, and she uh, uses the scalpel and cuts his face, like from his lip all the way up to his ear. And <coughs> he's like bleeding a bunch. And basically, uh, he dies in the factory. And she, it almost sounds like, that's the one thing I don't like about the ending, is that uh, Natsuo Kurino writes it so that it seems like Masako is, like, feeling sorry for Satake, the evil man who, you know, raped her and tried to kill her. I don't know. It, to me, it seemed like she kind of pitied him at the end, but I don't know. I, me, I think she should have just been like, yeah, man, die. Bleed to death. But, uh... And then at the end of the book, uh, it ends with uh, Masako basically deciding that she was going to figure out what kind of freedom she wanted in her life and move on f from everything and just go somewhere else and live a new life, basically. Because uh, she had talked to her husband and to her son, and she basically told her son, uh, Nobuki, basically that, hey, you're grown now. You live your life how you're going to live it. I'm, and I, basically, I won't be here soon. And then her husband, she basically said, you know, if I leave, will you look for me? And she, he's like, no, nah, I won't. And so they basically were done. So 
basically it ends with Yoshie basically assumingly she wasn't going to work at the factory anymore Kuniko's dead Ayo Yamamoto oh that's one thing I missed Ayo Yamamoto before uh, Satake is killed uh, before the final battle I guess Satake goes to uh, Yayo Yamamoto's house and says that, oh, I'm here to pay my respects to your husband. So he goes to the little shrine they have in the house, does that, and then he comes back and he's like, and then she figures out that he was the guy who owned the casino. And he he basically threatens, like, I'll kill you if you don't go to the bank and get the money that you got for the insurance. So basically he steals and robs her of the insurance money, goes to the bank, and he's there pretending to be her brother and takes the money out and then he takes the money and you know runs and then she has no money nothing to go on but uh, the thing is Yayoi Yamamoto didn't tell Masako what happened and I feel like if she would have then Masako would have figured out who Satake was a lot sooner and uh, I just think she should have said that but she didn't because I don't know I don't know why the character wouldn't have said that but uh, just how the author wrote it I guess but, uh, so the Satake guy stole all that money, and I don't know. It was just, it's an interesting book. I ain't re ever read a book like it, I guess. But if you can get past all the violent stuff, it's an interesting book about broke people who desperately need money, willing to do almost anything for the money, and uh, who are lonely and who... Seem, seemingly have no one in their life, you know, and the people who are in their life have drifted so far apart, and uh, in the words of the book, it was something like, once they went so far, there was no way they could ever go back to where they were, and they just needed to find a way out of the lives that they were living.